Mark chapter 9. We are going to we're going to look at this passage of Scripture this morning, starting in verse 14. But let me remind you what's just happened. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. They went up onto the mountain, just the four of them. And there Jesus was transfigured before them in dazzling white raiment. And Moses and Elijah appeared, and they were talking with him there uh, on the mountain. Peter uh, wanted to build some tabernacles there. And and the Shekinah glory of God in a cloud overshadowed them, and they heard the voice speaking directly to them from the Father. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. And uh, so as they are traveling back down, they have the discussion about Elijah. When's Elijah come? How's that all work? They're trying to sort all this out. And you remember, Jesus told them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until after I am raised from the dead, which made them even more confused about their eschatology. Well, meanwhile, while that's all been taking place with Jesus and these three, the rest of his men have been down in the valley. And so lots of people have drawn this, this inference, but I would point it out to you, and it, it, it really is worth noting, I think. There are mountaintop experiences, and then there are demonically infested valleys. And that's what life is all about. You go from one to the other as you travel through life. There's times that you're up on top of the mountain and you've, you've seen the, the, something like they've seen. You've just had this magnificent encounter with the Lord and you just feel like you're on top of the world. And then there's times that, you know, after that happens, you, you proceed right back down into the battle. And you've got to always remember that. Don't ever take the armor off. Make sure you don the armor every day because the battle wages on. And so let's look there in verse 14. It says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was Come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Let's pray together. Father, we need your help today. We pray for the Spirit to be our teacher and help us, God, to understand your word. We know, Lord, that your word has a purpose and that it's going to accomplish that purpose in our lives. We pray, God, that we would be willing that we would be hearers who have ears to hear what your Spirit has to say. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I, I titled this, All Things Are Possible to Him That Believeth, and I, I absolutely believe that. Uh, and, <laughs> I, man, I, Mr. Barker, I got a text this week that Chad was going to be gone. He said you were going to take care of the, of the music. And I, as I'm praying about this and thinking about this, I thought, you know, we really should sing Faith is the Victory today. 
It's actually one of my points. It's point number three on your bulletin. Faith is the victory. But I didn't call him. I didn't tell him. And he hasn't even looked at my notes. And so I don't know about you, but, but every now and then coincidences happen in my life. And when coincidences, when coincidences happen to me, one of the things that I know is, is I know that there's no such thing as coincidences, but that God is at work. And so, so that is just pretty cool. I was laughing. Wendy's like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, I'll tell you in a minute. Faith is the victory. That, that's, that's what this is all about. That's what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. And he doesn't have long to be with them. They've got to learn these lessons. You remember the loaves and the fishes. He does it twice. He does it in front of them all. And they were so hard-hearted that they didn't get it. So he does it again. And they completely miss the whole point. He has to explain it to them again. And, and we're into a similar situation with this. And, and here's the thing. You know, it, it's so easy for us to read these stories and just go, man, you guys are so dense. Why can't you? I mean, you've got Jesus there. Why, why are you so uh, unbelieving? Why, why do you struggle so much with their faith? But I don't know about you, but this is one of the most faith-building passages that I can think of in my own life, especially with what the father of the child says. His confession to Jesus is magnificent. Magnificent. You know, there are some people who go around bowed up with like this, that I have faith and I, my faith can move mountains and things like that. I am not like that. I am the guy that I have to get my faith stirred up every single day and multiple times a day. And, and I, I completely understand these guys that have seen these things happen and then completely miss it the next time it comes about. I, I, I get it. I'm with them. And I think that's why our Lord teaches the way that he does. Well, the first thing I want you to see is the failure of these disciples. I want you to see their failure. This man, he hears that Jesus is in the area. He brings his son to him. Somehow, in all of the healings that have happened and the miracles that Jesus has performed, this man has yet to have his son present. But he finally decides, I've got to go to Jesus. He's the only one who can help me. So when he gets there, Jesus is not there. He, Peter, James, and John are up on the mountain. But the rest of the guys are there. And so he, he brings them to, the, hey, you guys are Jesus' disciples. Yes, we are. Well, here's the situation with my boy. Can you help him? And they try to cast this demon out, and they are unable to. Well, it causes such a stir that the scribes come, and you've got this huge crowd gathered around, and now you have an argument taking place. And I'm sure it's a theological argument taking place. So you have these three groups that are there. But the disciples have tried and failed. Now, I don't know about you. I, have you ever failed? Please don't raise your hand, but I'll raise mine. Have you ever failed at something that this book says that you ought to do? Even after you have walked with Jesus for many years? Like, how about this one? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I, I am a dismal failure at that on a daily basis. Or how about this one? <clears throat> love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How about reading through Corinthians and, and having the, the Bible point you back to the wilderness wanderings and for the scriptures to point out just how much God hates murmuring and complaining? I start griping about March the 15th, and I don't stop until April the 15th until they squeeze that tax check out of my hand. I gripe and complain about the price of gas. I complain about, you know, I, I'm just being honest with you. I, <clears throat> I understand these men. These men have walked with Jesus. They have seen him do the miracles that he has done. They've even participated in some of these things. And yet now here they are. And, and I tell you, here's, here's one of the things I think can happen. And I think maybe some of our young people here might understand this in regards to athletics. Have you ever gone out there and, and uh, underestimated your opponent? Gone out there and said, we mopped them up last week. This team's not nearly as good. Their number one ace isn't even here. This will be a piece of cake only to either almost get beat or get beat by somebody that you should have beat. 
because you were too cocky, you were too arrogant, you weren't prepared, whatever the reason. You underestimated the enemy. Well, see, I think that's where they are. They've seen this before. They've done this before. They're like, hey, no problem. We're in the demon casting out business. That's what our master does. That's what we do. Bring the boy. Go out of him. And nothing happens. And now they're like, well, Philip, you try. Go out of him. Nothing. Andrew, you're up. Well, here, let me lay my hand on him, you know. Get out, foul spirit. Nothing. Poor kid having a fit, being tormented horribly as we read this, just the incredible, awful, terrible situation that this boy is in. I understand these men, and here's one of the things I want you to know, I want you to understand. If God does not use sinful, fallen, frail failures, He doesn't use anyone. Can I get an amen to that? That's us. And so, so I, I think this is here for us to learn from that, to, to, to understand that we, are, that we are failures, that we are going to fail, but that Jesus is trying to, to teach us these lessons. And that leads us to the second thing, and that is Jesus' determination. He says, Oh, you faithless generation. See, it's not that they have not enough faith to do this. It's that they have zero. They are not trusting Jesus in this instance. They think they've got it themselves. They think that they are able to do this because they've done it in the past. Now, see the three groups that are there. As Jesus comes back... And, and he sees this great multitude, verse 14, his disciples, a great multitude, and the scribes. Okay, you've got three groups. And nobody has any power to deal with the enemy. The scribes, they are the proponents of a dead religion that is powerless. The crowd is enjoying the show, but they have no power to help or to do anything. And the disciples are embarrassed and defeated because they have no power, even though they know that they should and they think that they should have power in this situation. Jesus walks into this situation, verse 16. He asks the scribes. He doesn't even talk to his disciples first. The first thing he does is ask the scribes what's going on. What question are you with them? What are you, what are you asking my men here? What questions are you asking them? They don't even get a chance because somebody in the crowd hollers out, tells them. It happens to be the the boy's dad. He steps up. Master, I brought my son to you. You were not here, but these guys, your men, have tried. He says, he teareth him. He foameth. He gnasheth with his teeth. He pineth away. This sounds like rabies. I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen someone who has rabies, but they, they literally will turn into an animal, foam at the mouth, uh, just completely lose their mind. It's a horrible situation. And look what Jesus says. He says, they, they tried. I, I spake to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not, but they had tried. So Jesus answers. Verse 19 is very important for us here. There's going to be a lot of people in your life that are going to tell you you just need a little more faith or that you need to build your faith. That's not true. You're really not going to see that. They're going to ask for that, but that's not the case. The case is is that you need faith, all right? How much faith? We'll talk about that in a minute. But they have zero faith. Oh, faithless generation, our Lord says. How long shall I be with you? Not long now. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's over the halfway point of his ministry, which only lasts about three years. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He doesn't have long with them. He needs them to learn these lessons. And, well, so far they're not (laughs) doing so good. And I have to laugh because I understand. How long shall I suffer you? You know what that means? How long am I going to put up with you? How, how long am I going to put up with this? I've told you and I've told you. Have you ever been there? Have you, have you ever, you, you have a, uh, the, 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 the situation where someone that you are responsible for teaching and you've told them and you've told them and you've told them and you've told them and you've told them. 
and they still won't check the oil in their vehicle before they launch out onto a big trip. You know, you've told them, I told you. Check the water. Look at the gauge. Just look down at the gauges every now and then, you know. But I also understand when you're out on the road, you don't want to look at the gauges because if something's wrong, that means you're stranded. So you just pretend like it just, you know. That's what I do with that little check engine light. Just put a piece of black tape over it. It goes away, right? I don't want to look. I don't want to check on things, right? Hang up your towel after you take a shower. Put your clothes in the dirty clothes hamper. Stack your shoes up by the door. Uh, close the door when you come in. Turn the light off when you're finished in the room. You know, and you, and you come by and the light's on and the light's on and the light's on. And you're like, ah, how long do I, would you please just listen to me and learn the lesson? That's, that's kind of where he is. It's an exasperation type statement. But part of it has to do with his limited time with them. How long do I have with you? Not long. How long am I going to have to suffer this situation? Bring him to me. Bring him to me, he says. So they bring him unto Jesus. And by the way, folks, that's what you do with your wayward kid. That's what you do with your sick kid. That's what you do with your loved one. That's what you do with your situation. You bring it to Jesus. You don't go gossip about it. You don't go go seek the world's answers for it, you bring it to Jesus. And so, so he says, bring him to me. Verse 20, they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. You know, the, 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 the demon spirits, one of the things that we've seen is that a lot of times they want to remain hidden. And so they, they quietly torment people, but in a crowd or something like that, they kind of try to hide. And so, so, but when Jesus walks in, like for instance, back earlier in the book, when he walked into the synagogue, the spirit screams out, you know, I know who you are, Jesus, the son of the most high God, you know. And everybody's like, this guy's probably been there for years. And they had no idea that this was, was taking place in his life. Not this poor kid. This poor kid is tor tormented unbelievably by this spirit. He, he, he tears him, he says, he fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming. How much mental illness has been misdiagnosed that was actually demon possession in our day. How many people have been tormented by things like this that, that, you know, we've taken him to doctors, we've tried this, we've tried that, and yet what it is is the enemy, a demon. And the enemy has three things he wants to do according to John. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. And the father has recognized that in this poor kid's life. He asks him, Verse 21, how long is it ago since this came unto him? How long have you dealt with this? Now, by the way, remember as Jesus asked this question, he knows the answer to this, all right? He, he knows this. But he's, he's wanting this, this dad to talk to him. He's wanting this dad to realize and to just stop and, and think about the incredible, awful situation that his boy is in and, and, and just how much the enemy has taken from him, stolen from him in his life. And he said of a child, we don't know how old this young man is that is brought to Jesus, but this has been going on for a long time. He says, sometimes it tries to cast him into the fire. Can you imagine the burn marks on this boy that's been thrown into the fire by this demon? He says, sometimes he tries to cast him into the water. He's tried to drown him. I've had to go and drag my son out of the water. Maybe they were at the pool of Siloam, or maybe they were one of the places there in the area, or maybe in the Sea of Galilee. That, that you know, I mean, every time this demon tries to get, he's, he's tearing this kid up, he's tormenting this kid, and he's trying to kill him. And so he says there, verse 22, if thou canst do anything, Lord, if there's some way, if, if there's anything you can do, Please have compassion on us and help us. Now, it's an interesting statement. And it's almost a, it, it's a question. I think he's also trying to be polite. Instead of demanding something from Jesus, he's asking, if there's any way you can help me, please help me. But I love the way that Jesus comes back with this, verse 23. He says, if you can help us, please help us. Jesus says, if you can believe... If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. 
Now, you know what's, what's really uh, uh, interesting about this is, and by the way, this is point number three, faith is the victory. And, and it really is. This is the victory. It is impossible to please God without faith. You, you cannot please God without faith. You must trust Jesus. You must trust Him with your eternal salvation. You must trust Him with your family. You must trust Him with your decision-making process. You must trust Him in prayer. You must trust Him in, in, in his reading His Word and, and applying it to your life. When you look at how should I live life, how should I order my life, you must trust Jesus, right? And so, so he, he, he says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. You know, here's what's so sad, and it's, it's too bad. In our day, the LGBTQ movement has stolen or tried to steal the rainbow. By the way, don't let them do it. We know what the rainbow means. The rainbow is God's covenant promise to all of mankind, lost and saved, every human being, that he'll never flood the earth again. It's never going to happen again. Every single time you see it, it should take you back to Genesis and remind you of God's promise. That's what it's for. And the word of faith movement has stolen from us faith. And it's, it's too bad because what they've done is, is they've basically made faith into magic, into wishful thinking. <clears throat> faith, if I drum up enough faith, then God is obligated to do for me. That's basically what the Word of Faith movement teaches. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because true faith, real faith, means that I hear the Word of God and I believe the Word of God. That's what faith is. So I don't go to God. Let's think about it for a minute. Let's take Noah. Okay? The Word of Faith movement says, you dream up the plan that you want, the life that you want, the lifestyle that you want. You go to God and you believe hard enough and you speak into existence what you want to happen and God will see your faith and then he will, like a magic genie or I call the magic Coke machine, you know, I put in my faith quarter and pow, out rolls my Coke. God is obligated then to give that to me. So let's take that and let's look at Noah. That's what Noah did, right? Noah got up one day. He said, God, this world is such a mess. Here's the plan. I'm going to build a boat. I'm going to save my family. I'm going to save the animals. You send the rain, kill everybody off, right? No, that's not what happened. One day God came to Noah and said, Noah, here's the plan. You build the boat. I'm going to send the rain. And if you don't build the boat, there will be no salvation for anybody. But if you build the boat, I'll save you and your family. We'll save the animals, and I'm going to start over with you. Do it. And Noah believed him. Noah had nothing to go on. He had no, I, I believe that he had never actually seen it rain before that. <clears throat> he, he had nothing to compare to. He had no, there was nothing. Think about this. Abraham, one day, he's sitting there in his hometown where he lived with his family around him. He says, God, here's the plan. I've heard of this land way to the west. I want it. I want it for me and future generations. I want you to give me descendants like the sand on the seashore, so I'm going to load up and move to that land. I'm going to walk all over it and tramp all over it, and you need to give me every place that my foot treads. God says, okay, gosh, you're such a faithful man. I believe you. you know, let's do it. Is that what happened? No. God comes to Abraham one day. He says, Abraham, pack up, move. Go to a land that you've never seen, you've never heard of, but I'm going to give it to you. Well, even in doing so, Abraham is still halting in his faith, even though he is the father of our faith. The example the New Testament takes us to for faith is Abraham. He only made it halfway. He went to Haran and had to wait till his daddy died before he went on to Canaan. He, he was slow in going about doing what he did. Then once he got there, he, it was too dry for him, so he packs up and he moves out of town because he's trying to find God. said, no, 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 go back. Then he lies about Sarah being his his wife says she, he's, she's her sister, almost gets himself in a terrible bind with that. Then he can't believe God enough to, to, to believe that Sarah, who's way too old to be having babies, is going to have a son. So he takes a, a wife at Sarah's suggestion, Hagar, and he, he raises Ishmael as a result of that. God keeps saying, no, nope, nope, I'm going I'm to give you a son. I'm going to make your descendants like the sand seashore. I'm going to give you a child through Sarah. Sarah can't even believe it. She laughs. And yet, God brings them to this place 
and their faith was that they heard what God said, and however haltingly and however bit by bit, they believed him with a lot of mistakes in between. That's where this man is. That's where the disciples are. If you can believe, all things are possible to you who believe. What a statement. What an under, I don't know, is there a Bible here that that verse is not underlined in? If there is, and you write in your Bible, underline the thing. Highlight that. Verse 23. What a verse. What a promise. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Man, I like that. I like that. I want those kind of things. I want that in my life. I've got some things that I can't do that I need done. I have some, some people I'd like to reach that I can't reach, but I'd like them reached. I, I, I've got some questions that I don't have answered that I'd like to have answered. And I like that all things. I like that word possible. Years ago, I have a Red Webster's Dictionary. And for whatever reason, I was looking up an I word. And I had forgot that years before that, I'd done a little work in my dictionary. And so I was looking for an I word, and someone had taken a pen and scribbled out an entire word in my dictionary. It's like, what? Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that. It's the word impossible. I had gone in there one day when I was praying, and I had scribbled out the word impossible. That's not, I don't even want that in my dictionary, because with God, all things are possible. And all things are possible to him that believeth. What an incredible, awesome statement. But you must understand, faith is the victory. You must believe. Ask and believe, and you shall receive. Pray and doubt and go without. That's what Adrian Rogers said, and it's very true. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory. You must believe God. You must believe His Word. And so Jesus tells him this. He says, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears. Now, now this, is, this is incredible because there's a huge crowd here. This man has taken all of his dignity, and he has thrown it completely out the window. He has, and, and, and it makes me wonder if he wasn't so embarrassed before is why he's missed out, why he's so late to, to bring his son. Because Jesus has never turned anyone away that brought a sick or demon-possessed person to him up to this point in time. Everyone has been healed. And so I don't know why he's so late. But as he does, he finally, he just throws it and he cries, the Bible says. He hollers out. And he said with tears, the man is bawling his head off as he's watching his son be tormented this way. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> now, that, if that's not the most honest statement in the Bible, I don't know what is. What an incredible honesty on the part of this man. He refuses to pretend. You know, some people would stand there and they would pretend. I believe. Think about Peter. Lord, no matter what, if everyone goes away from you, I will never only minutes later, almost literally minutes, to deny Jesus three times, you know? I mean, I mean so, so, so Peter's kind of pretending. He's, he's trying to drum up faith, trying to drum up courage. This man doesn't do that. He's just honest. I believe. Help my unbelief. If his faith meter, if you could measure his faith meter from zero to 100, I'm thinking it's registering like one or two is what he's saying. I got 98% unbelief. Nothing has ever been able to help my boy. Even your disciples can't help him. But there's this teeny tiny little part in me that wants to believe so bad and that does believe. And, and I've seen you do it before. I've heard about you doing it before. It's this little bitty thing. It, it's like 2%, maybe one and a half. But help my unbelief. Man, listen to me. Please listen to me and hear this. There's no need to ever play games with God because He knows your heart. When you are having a hard time believing, you should be honest with Him because He already knows. That's what this man does. I call this man the honest man because he's just, he just straight up as honest as he can possibly be. Look with me in James real quick. Chapter 1. 
James tells us there in chapter 1, he says, <clears throat> verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed of the wind. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But if you are double-minded, confess that to the Lord. That's what he does here. This is a statement of faith and a confession of sin. Lord, I believe a little bit, and I'm doubting you, which I know is sin. I know is wrong. I know I shouldn't, but I am, and I'm confessing it. I'm just coming clean before you, Lord. What an incredibly honest man. And that brings up the next thing, and that is that the disciples had forgotten the source of their power. The reason that they could not cast this demon out is because they were not trusting Jesus. He calls them a faithless generation. All of them, the whole crowd, the man, the disciples, everybody. But at Jesus' word, when he tells us, if, if thou canst believe, he does not say, by the way, this is one of those reasons why I use the King James Version here. Because he's, he's talked to the scribes. What are you all debating about? He's heard from the Father. His disciples, so far we haven't heard him talk to them yet. But we've got this whole crowd here. Here's what Jesus did not say. If ye can believe, all things are possible to you. He did not say that. He said, if thou can believe. The T's are singular. The wise are plural. So he does not tell the crowd if y'all can believe. He tells the man if you can believe. In the midst of the crowd, in the midst of the unbelief of the world that you live in, in the midst of an unbelieving family maybe, in the midst of an unbelieving, uh, even an unbelieving church, one person, just one, if thou, you, yourself, if thou canst believe, he singles out the man. And when he saw the people, he says, straightway the father of the child, he cries out, I believe, help thou mine end belief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And even then, even as this happens, it's not a, a quiet parting. This demon tries to hurt this boy one last time. He says he rent him sore. I, I really, honestly, I have no idea what that, that means. But I think I know. And I think what that looks like is, is I think that, that his head popped back, his arms, his joints were put out of place. I think he cast him to the ground. It says that, that when it finally happened, he was as one dead. They all thought that he had died. It had been so violent this departure of this foul spirit. Folks, listen, please do not underestimate the enemy. The enemy is powerful. The enemy is clever. The enemy is deadly and dangerous. Please do not underestimate the enemy. You know what we, what we miss here, or I, we're not missing it. God would have given it to us if we needed it. We don't need it. What we would like to have, I think, is how did he get in that state, right? What happened to him? When did this spirit enter him? We know what happened as a child, but why? But you know what? In all of these, we never hear of how that happened. We just see the evidence that it did. Now, one of the things that I believe is, is I believe there was an onslaught of enemy invasion at the time of Jesus' ministry. I think that, that Jerusalem was a hotbed of demonic activity at that point in time because of the war, because of the enemy, because of what was going on. But, but I don't know... I don't know that that daddy did anything wrong for that child to wind up in that state. Which you'd like to say, well, you know, his SRA situation had taken place or they were, you know, they, they, the, the daddy was secretly worshiping some false god or goddess or playing with a Ouija board or I don't know. Well, you know, all these kind of things. Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe it's a Job type situation. It's just, this is, this is the situation that that father found himself in. I don't know. No blame is ever placed on anyone as to why it happened. It just is, and Jesus deals with it, and the demon is violent as he comes out of him. So they think that he's dead. But the, the disciples had forgotten the source of, of their power. Verse 28, when he was coming to the house, 
his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? They, they literally have no idea. Turn with me back to Mark chapter 6 for just a second. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. You remember there, it says, Mark 6, 7, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Now look at verse 13, Mark six thirteen, And they cast out many devils, and anointed, many with, uh, with, anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. <coughs> Excuse me. So, they've already had victory doing this before. I totally understand these guys. I mean, I've had a flat tire before. When I have a flat tire, I don't panic. I get out, I go to digging around for a jack, a four-way, and change the tire, right? Only this time, the four-way's the wrong size, the jack won't lift the vehicle, nothing works the way that it did the last time that we did it. That's where they are. We've been here before this is what we did. We, we didn't have to work it up. We didn't have to drum it up. Jesus told us, go heal the sick and cast out demons. We went. When we encountered a demon, we said, get out. And he left. No mumbo jumbo, no, no ritual, no formula. No, no. We just, we had authority over them. So when the man comes up to them, they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. We're in the demon casting out business. But it doesn't work. And they don't know why. But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you what happened. They underestimated the enemy. They also underestimated what Jesus had done for them on that short-term mission trip. He had given them that ability. But that ability does not reside within you or me, ever. We do not have authority over these enemies apart from Jesus. And so he's got to be the one that does it. He's got to be the one who does it through us if it is to happen. And that's what they forgot. They forgot the source of their power. They thought it was something that they could always do on their own and on their own. And what, is, what does Jesus say in John 15? Apart from me, how much can you do? Nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And so, so they forgot the source of their power. Look with me at Matthew 17. This is a parallel passage of this same incident, the same story. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, it says, <clears throat> they come to him and they ask him, when they, they get back to the house, they, they go to the house, and, and they ask him, they say, why couldn't we cast this demon out? And Jesus said unto them, Matthew seventeen twenty, because of your unbelief. You were not believing. Now, what are they supposed to be believing in? Because here's another thing that our world and the positive movement has tried to steal from the truth, and that is that you need to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Oh, I hear it all the time, especially in the athletic world. Oh, my goodness. The rodeo world. Good grief. You've got to believe in yourself. 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 All the time. Cowboy preachers. Believe in yourself. Apart from me, how much can we do? Zippo. Zero. Nothing. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. You don't want to believe in yourself, especially in spiritual things, especially in dealing with the enemy, especially in, 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 in uh, encountering uh, something having to do with the Word of God. You want to rely on Christ. And this, especially for men, I'm here to tell you, for guys, our entire life we have been taught especially if you're an American man, a red-blooded good old boy, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and men get her done. That's what we do. And you believe in yourself. You go out there and you have confidence. You be confident. What that means is, is cocky and proud. We like those terms. And that's how we get things done. And I've made my entire existence by being like John Wayne, you know, just bow out your chest believe in yourself well they believed in themselves they had done this in the past and nothing happened and so when they ask the master why he says because of your unbelief you were not trusting in christ you had forgotten the source of your power 
For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. The man, the father, demonstrates how much faith you need. I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe a little bit, Lord. I'm believing. He didn't say I'm trying to believe either, you know. He said, I believe. I, I, there, there's, there's something. There's this tiny little thing. But he knew. He was embarrassed by how little it was. That's why he asked him to help the part that he wasn't believing in. Listen, I, I, I hope that you can understand this this morning. I'm trying to, I'm trying to convey this, and I'm, I'm not doing a very good job. Nobody has got 100% magnanimous faith that is just this incredible thing. And by the way, God knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. We are sinful, fallen people. We, we constantly have to go to Him and confess our sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing for our sins. We constantly have to go to Him and, and get filled up again with the Spirit. We're constantly trying to be crammed into the mold of the world, and we've got to constantly fight against that to have our mind transformed. It's one of the reasons why we come to church and get a dose of the ghost on a weekly basis, on a multiple weekly basis, to get to get back into the Word, to remind ourselves to get up in the morning and get into the Word and read something like that and go, man, I can't believe it. Within a couple of days, three days ago, I was believing God so great, everything was going good, and then the wheels fell off. And what did I do? I reverted back to my old self, trying to handle it myself, trying to do it myself, instead of believing in Jesus. I, 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 I lost my temper. I flew off the handle. And, and now I got to stop and I got to get back to where I was. I got to get back into the Word. I got to get back on my knees and I got to beg God, please help me. I'm reverting back to the flesh, to the old me. I'm trusting in myself. I'm getting prideful. I'm getting arrogant. By the way, too, when you have spiritual victories, which they've just had, this is a natural thing, man. We, I led him to Christ, led her to Christ, led that one to Christ, and all of a sudden I run into a brick wall. Now what just happened? Well, you're not believing. That's just, that's just the bottom line. And you can so quickly and so easily forget your source of power. There's no power apart from Jesus. There's no power apart from faith in Christ. That is the power that we must have to do the things that he's called us to do, like confront the enemy. And so, so he, he tells them, he says, it's because of your unbelief not because of your small belief. It's because of your unbelief. Zero belief. The last thing I want you to see is verse 29. And verse 29 is, is one of the tools, two of the tools that God is using, uh, has given us to get us back to where we need to be. He says there, they, they, they want to know, why could we not cast him out? Verse 29, he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So we want to we see the last thing here is, is fasting forces focus on Jesus. That's what it does. Fasting forces you to focus on Jesus. One of the things that you and I do is we fall into patterns in life. One of those patterns that I have is sleep. I like sleep. I'm fond of sleep. I look forward to going to sleep. About 9 o'clock at night, I'm ready to shut her down. My crew keeps rolling for another hour and a half sometimes, and it drives me crazy because I like it to be dark and quiet when I go to sleep. My house is very seldom like that. But anyway, <clears throat> one of the things I like to do is eat. I love to eat. I'm good at eating. I'm telling you, I haven't met very many foods that I don't like. I'm good at it. So when I read about something like fasting, that is like way low on my oh boy, that sounds like fun list, right? It's right down there beside youth lock-ins. <laughs> I'd just as soon be whipped with a dead rabbit as go to a youth lock-in, all right? And I'd just as soon eat the dead rabbit as to fast. I would gladly do that. But he tells us here, he says, he says when you encounter the enemy in this way, the only way that you're going to get to the point where you can have the faith to face this enemy is by prayer and fasting. 
the Lord Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us about three acts of righteousness that all believers should do. He talks about giving alms, he talks about prayer, and he talks about fasting. And in each one of them, he does not say if you give alms, if you pray, and if you fast. He says when you give, give alms, do it in this way. When you pray, do it in this way. And when you fast, do it in this way. Fasting is something that God has expected from us. Is fasting always to do with food? No. You could fast from, from you know, all kinds of different things. But food will get you there quicker than anything else. You can fast from Facebook and say, I'm not going to look at Facebook. I'm going to spend time in prayer. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. And that will help you to focus on Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, if you need to get a hold of heaven, if you need to get through to God, if you need to lay hold upon God, just skip a meal. And if you haven't got a hold of him yet, just skip the next one. And then skip the next one. And you do that until you get to where you need to be. The old guys used to call it praying through. You, you just pray through. Because guess what? If you're going to pray in faith, you've got to have a word from God. And fasting is for one of those times when you're like, you know, I, I don't really know what to pray. I want to pray for this. But I'm not sure if that's God's will. Listen, I've got all the confidence in the world that when I pray according to God's will, He hears me and He will answer my prayer. First John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, I believe, right? Total confidence in that. But what about when I'm not sure? What about when my friend lays dying? Do I pray that he goes quickly or that God heals him? Now, there are some people who are like, well, that's foolish, preacher. You should never pray that God take them. Really? We prayed over a, a woman one time in, in Africa that was riddled with HIV, and she was wither, withered away to nothing. And she was trembling all over. There was nothing they could do for her. We came walking up to that woman, and immediately in my spirit, I knew we need to pray that God takes her quickly. I did not pray that God heal that poor lady. Please, God, take her. Take her home. I asked her family. And she blew, Oh, yeah, she's a believer. She knows Jesus. God, please take her quickly. But what about when you don't know? When you're not sure? I don't know. Do I, well, do I go this way or do I go that way? Where should I go to college? Who should I marry? What about this? Should we, should we move? Should we do these things? And you don't know. That's a great time to use these tools that God has given you. Skip a meal. Don't take for granted that, that everything's just going to go on like normal. Treat life as if it's not normal at that point in time. Because this is what you do when you're in a desperate situation. I can remember a couple of times in our life where we weren't sure if, I wasn't sure if Wendy was going to survive. I wasn't sure if one of my kids was going to survive. Food was the last thing I was worried about at that moment in time. I was by their side. I was doing what needed to be done. And I was trying to get in hold, a hold of God. And so, so I, I really think in, in my, my little pea brain way of thinking, that's the best way that I can sum it up. Fasting focuses you in a way that you wouldn't focus normally if your body was, was getting nourished and treated well. Like, you know, I mean, I, I take, well, I, I'm telling you, I take good care of myself. I'm, I do. I mean, like, I put the condiments on things. I make it taste. I put seasonings on. I like, I like it to taste good. Not just quantity, you know, quality. I, I like food. But when you tell your body, no, you're telling your flesh, no, no, we're going to shut out this world. We're going to shut out this flesh. And the only thing we care about is talking to God. And, and that's how serious the situation was. And the disciples, they didn't take it that seriously. We've seen this before. We'll deal with it the same way we did in the past. And when they failed, what this is doing, what Jesus is doing in this story is he's bringing us all right to this point. And this is, this is it. If you're going to deal with the spiritual issues of the day, you must deal with them in faith. And if you're going to have faith, sometimes you have to turn this world off. That's what fasting is. You turn it off. You shut it down. You get alone. You get with God. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus. That's what discipleship's all about. And they forgot that. <laughs> they forgot it. And I don't know about you, but... And, and by the way, this is, this is not, you know, I, I pray that you don't live every day in that kind of desperation. 
I mean, in one way or another, we are desperate people every day. But there are times that you must, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And basically what he's telling them is, is you guys ran off half cocked into a situation that you weren't ready for. And what you should have done is realize how desperate it was. Think about Jesus here in just a few months after this, what he's going to do. They're going to fast. They're, they're going to have the, the Lord's Supper, and then that's it. They're not going to eat anymore. They're going to go to the garden. They're going to get alone, and he's going to beg them to pray for him, and they're going to fall asleep. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is so weak. Well, and your flesh is weak, and that's what fasting is to show. Fasting will prove that to you faster than anything else that you can do. I, I'm telling you. And don't fast. When you're going to fast, don't skip the meal you usually skip. Well, I'm praying today, so I don't eat breakfast. Well, you never eat breakfast. That don't count. Just skip eating all day. Skip eating all week until you break through. Until, and, you, and you'll know it. God will release you from that. Well, you'll, you'll know exactly when that moment comes. You'll be, you'll be praying. You'll be desperate, trying to get a hold of God, searching the Word of God. And bam, there'll come a breakthrough. There'll come an answer. There'll come a relief. Something will change. And when that changes, you'll know. But I just want to encourage you today. Learn the lessons. Jesus, Jesus wants us to learn these lessons, and that's what this is all about. Faith is the victory. You've got to trust the Lord. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for your word. God, we ask you to help us to realize that, that <clears throat> there's nothing impossible for the one who will believe you. And God, that there's times that we're just like this father, that our, our, our faith is so tiny and so small, it's so infinitesimal, it doesn't even, doesn't even seem to us that it registers. And we need help with the unbelief that we're wrestling with, but that we'll bring what faith we have to you. And we'll come to you with that tiny little mustard seed-sized faith. And we'll say, Lord, I, I, I trust you. I believe you. Help my unbelief. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for being raised from the dead. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.